We're preparing to stream on YouTube and we are live and attendees are joining us now. And are we recording too? Um, let me see if I can. Preparing to stream on YouTube and we are live. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Welcome. We're just going to get started in one second here. Thanks, Christine. And Christine, I just muted you because we could hear your um, YouTube playing. <laughs> so we just want to make sure that's muted. Um, all right. Hello, everybody. So we'll get started now. Welcome to today's webinar called Optimizing Your Conference Experience. Now, um, this is an hour and a half webinar and I've got a couple of awesome guests with me, but just so you're aware, this presentation is being recorded and it's also being streamed live to YouTube. So if you have any trouble with the Zoom today, you can hop over to the YouTube page, um, the LPI YouTube page. It'll be the live stream on the home page, and you can also participate there. We'll be monitoring it for questions and comments. I have a QR code here. It'll also be given at the end of the presentation, but this is a resource packet with additional um, materials, recordings, articles about the topics we're gonna address today. Things like networking advice, um, guides for putting together posters or for giving virtual talks. So if you want to scan that QR code, I'll give you all a second to do that. Okay, so we'll move on in just a second here, but basically this is for anybody who wants to learn a little bit more and just get a little bit more prepared for science conferences, not just the Lunar and Planetary Science Conference, although that's what's on our mind right now. It's coming up in a few weeks. All right, Christine, let's go to the next slide. Okay, so we are going to meet our awesome panel. First off, I'll just say hi. I'm Grace Bodwin. Um, I'm a senior science engagement specialist here at the Lunar and Planetary Institute. And I'm also joined by Dr. Janie Redabow. Hello, nice to see you everyone. Do you want me to say any more at this point or just? Oh, uh, yeah. Please okay. introduce yourself. Oh, yeah, good. Tell us uh, how many, like, have you been to LPSC before? Oh, yes. Oh, my gosh. Well, so first of all, uh, honestly, that's my favorite. I might even say my favorite week of the year. And I have lots of really good weeks during the year because um, I love to travel. I love to go to conferences and go to um, field work and things all around the world. But I love my week at LPSC. Um, and I think at this stage, it's because I get to see all my friends. And also just hear about all the latest and greatest in my field that's just right directly in the center of LPSC. Just, you know, geology of the planets, science of the planets, interiors, atmospheres, everything. And you get to hear about all of that this week. So I really love it. I, my day job is I teach um, geology at Brigham Young University and uh, go out in the field with my students as much as I can and study the solar system. Titan and Io and Pluto, Mars, places like that. Awesome. Thank you, Janie. Uh, we also are joined by Dr. David Train. Hey, everybody. Um, I'm, I'm a faculty member at the University of Hawaii at Manoa, um, where I work mostly on uh, geological surfaces of uh, airless bodies, mostly in the inner solar system, so moon, Mercury, um, and, I've, and asteroids. And I've touched a little bit on um, Mars and Venus. But um, I also am working on my master's in counseling psychology. So you guys may remember me if you guys have seen a survey for the last year. Um, that was a survey where I was doing a mental health survey um, of the planetary science field. So I'm kind of working on the therapy side of myself as well. Um, so I've been to LPSC since 2009. Um, I keep thinking that was like a few years ago, but I guess it's a lot longer than I thought. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, definitely kind of you know reflecting what has been said is it's pretty much a the way i like to think of uh conferences it's a it's a high school reunion um it's except it's every year it's a lot of fun um but it does take time to break into it um so i do understand a lot of the anxiety that comes with it and if you're with your first one but once once you're in it um once you, you get to know the crowd it is a fun week of just um socializing 
you know, get hearing about other people's work. So it gives you a lot of motivation and excitement about research. I mean, because, you know, after a while, you might feel the, uh, I did this again, but conferences always brings back that excitement um, and that reunion. So feeling so, yeah, it's a great time. Thank you. That's uh, such positive feelings about getting to go to conferences. So I hope it will help everyone feel more confident and excited about whatever upcoming conference you're preparing for. And then lastly, but not least, we're joined by Christine Shupla. Hi, everyone. So glad to be here with you and excited and getting ready for LPSE. So Christine is my manager here at the LPI and has tons of experience with participating in LPSC, organizing events, and supporting students and scientists as they participate. So, Christine, can we go to the next one? This is just one little note at the bottom. Oh, um, and you. Basically, no science conference, LPSC or otherwise, is complete without the broader community and those students and early career scientists who are coming in and are going to be the eventual leaders in the field. Okay, now we'll go to the next slide. Okay, so we've got a quick poll question just for everyone who's here. Um, this will just take a couple of seconds, but basically which of these best describes you? This is non-exhaustive, but try to pick whatever you most closely identify with, whether you're a, a student, postdoc, or perhaps early, mid, or late career professional. We gave everybody five more seconds. Sure. Four, three, two, one. All right. So thank you all um, for participating. We've got a lot of graduate students in the audience, but a couple other folks as well. So I'm so excited to have you here. And um, I will just say we're going to be answering questions throughout. If you have questions or comments, please feel free, put them in the chat, put them in the Q&A. We really wanna hear from you, okay? Okay, let's move on. All right, so this is the first bit of input we're gonna ask for everyone to participate. We're gonna do a chat storm. If you've never done this before, it goes like this. This is your prompt and you're gonna type it into the chat box, but you're not gonna press enter until I tell you to. And then we're all gonna enter our responses together at the same time. Okay, so your prompt is, what professional concerns do you have about attending a science conference? What might make you nervous or just a little bit anxious about coming to a science conference? So think about it. I'll be quiet for a second, type it into the chat box, and then I'll tell you when to press enter. And if possible, go ahead and select everyone so that everyone is going to see your response when you do hit enter. A couple more seconds. Okay, and then when I get to zero, press enter. Three, two, one, zero. All right, thanks for participating. So if you want to scroll through, you can look at these, but basically it's good to just get it out there. What are you worried about? Maybe you're worried about losing track of time and not getting through all the things you wanted to do. Maybe you're worried about struggling with your presentation or getting choked up on stage, not being able to answer questions. I'm always really nervous about networking. So we all have these fears and it's good to just go in wide-eyed and figure out how best we can address them. So let's move on. Okay, now the last activity up at the front is to think about setting some goals. So, you don't have to share these. I would recommend putting this down in a piece of paper, in a notepad, or just mentally taking a second to think, why are you attending LPSC or some other conference? What is your purpose for going to the conference? And what are you hoping to achieve? So silence is weird, but I'm gonna be quiet for like a minute. <laughs> 
while we think about these goals and then we'll move on. You don't have to share these. All right. Um, so I'm going to open this up and ask my panelists, Janie and David, what are your goals? And how might your goals be different now than they used to be? Janie, you wanna go first? Sure. Um, I, I guess one thing I try to do, um, I, I used to worry about this too. Am I gonna make it to all the talks that I want to? Am I going to, you know, make sure to get to all the, all the sessions. Am I going to be able to get up in, in the morning? And I think I used to try that for a while where I was staying out late because there's all the networking that happens late, but then trying to get up for that 8.30 session every day. So I, I mean, my sleep was really, really restricted during LPSC in the early years. And that was fun. It was a fun way to do it. And I don't do that anymore. So if I stay out late, then I'm going to have to realize, well, I bet I'm not going to make that very first talk. So I need to sort of prepare for that. Well, if I'm giving the first talk, I got to be there, right? So <laughs> I need to watch my time the night before. Um, but there just are so many things that are there for you to do that I do treat it as a little bit of a random walk. But then I also try to like, like, I think this week, I'm going to see, oh, when should I do an IO lunch? Or when should I, and if I plan it, then I know I can be there. And so I will try to do just a couple things, and then just leave it open so that I don't put a lot of pressure on myself and just try to just wander through the meeting and see what happens. Yeah, I really like the lack of pressure. Um, what usually when my goal of going to um, a conference LPSC, it's like, well, the first goal is always present your work, right? Um, but I, I, I guess I don't, you know, take it too like I need to make it to these talks um, because the one thing that's nice about LPSC, but it's also kind of horrible, I guess, is those long abstracts, right? They're painful to write, but if you miss a talk, you know, it's okay. The abstract is there. And in fact, you're going to remember more from the abstract than you are going to remember from the talk sometimes, right? Um, so for me, I think it's just making sure that I network with people, I refresh those, um, those connections, and I get caught up on what they're doing, right? So, um, and then usually before, if I have like things that I'm like interested in, like, you know, usually I'll go through the um, entire um, agenda, see who's giving talks and what topic sounds interesting, catch certain people um, or having to talk to certain people. But, you know, my list isn't that huge. It's mostly, you know, making sure that I'm constantly like there to, learn, um, learn new things, because sometimes you're going to run into talks that you're like, oh, my God, this is really useful for what I'm doing right now. Um, and you don't really expect it. So like sometimes if you don't go in there with that expectation, so like this is the things I have to do and just kind of like fall into something that you're just like, oh, my God, this is useful or something I'm just interested in. Maybe I'll go this direction in the future. Um, so, yeah, I don't really have too much of an agenda, to be honest, except just, you know, I just kind of see as an exciting experience, go talks learn um, and just be excited. I remember uh, when I was a student um, and not all of you have this, this uh, network, I guess already built in, but a lot of times we would try to go to each other's talks, you know, like that's, that was just a thing we did because we were all learning and trying to grow at the same time. And so what, one thing that might come out of this workshop potentially is, well, there's a whole group of you that now kind of know each other and maybe you could go to each other's talks or presentations if you have you know, if you don't have uh, other plans for that time or, or whatever, but just building those 
those relationships, learning about how each other succeeds or what tricks worked and things like that are, are all really good and supportive. Yeah, exactly. Especially since if you finish graduate school, since I think the poll said a lot of you guys are grad students, when you guys finish grad school, um, a lot of you guys are going to go to different, you know, institutes and stuff like that. And, um, you know, it's, it helps keep those connections with your um, classmates and your um, colleagues fresh, right? So, because you guys are going to be helping each other as well. Those are awesome points. Christine, could we go to the next slide? So, so as, as Janie and David summarized really nicely, there are a lot of different opportunities at conferences. Of course, your primary goal is probably to share your science and to learn, but you're also developing presentation and networking skills. You're picking up new perspectives and you're connecting with other researchers. And I think one of the most important things they touched on was that you should leave room for spontaneity. Um, you don't know what you don't know. And packing your schedule um, could, it's a great place to start, but I think maybe anchoring with certain things that you know you really wanna do, but then leaving room to explore and meet people and see talks that you might not expect could be really helpful. Okay, so let's keep going. All right, so a couple of things you can do when you are trying to pick out these anchor spots to organize your week around. Um, review the program and you can look for ways to engage. So go through the science sessions, um, go through the poster sessions and see which talks, which posters, which people do you really want to be present for. Um, there are workshops happening throughout the week and other kinds of peripheral meetings. If you haven't taken a look at those, um, find out what else is being offered that isn't just a science talk. And that can be a great way to meet people and, and learn new things as well. We are offering some student and early career events, um, including in-person and virtual networking and mentoring opportunities. I can drop the link to that page in the chat. If you haven't checked that out, give it a look. Um, and there are, are other communities that you can meet up with and join and find out what they might be offering at the conference as well. Um, and then there are things you can do to prepare before you even get there. Um, so things like you can update your online presence. If you have a LinkedIn, you have um, a website, a research gate account, things like that. You can make sure those are up to date so that when you're connecting with people and sharing your contact information, they can find you. Um, reach out to people you'd like to talk to at the conference and set up meetings in advance. I'm going to ask our panelists again, Janie, David, do you ever get requests to meet with people? Is that ever something that you're bothered by? Yeah, I mean, um, I don't actually get a, a ton of requests, but once in a while there are, especially if students are looking into our program or, or something like that. Um, and of course, it's it's great to get those requests. We know that the students are interested, they're, they're want, they want to be successful in the field. Usually if someone's reached out, then they're pretty proactive. And um, I mean, the same thing even goes for just being approached while you're at the meeting. I feel like, you know, we're all scientists. We, we have these egos. <laughs> we try not to think we do, but if someone comes up, oh, hey, you know, I really liked your paper, XX, whatever. And, and you're like, oh, thank you very much. Let me tell you more about this paper. <laughs> it's usually what you're going to get. So, um, so yeah, don't be afraid to just try to talk to people. And yeah, I do like this idea of setting things up ahead of time. I think that's a, a, a nice idea. Yeah, I, I think um, I yeah you don't we don't get a lot of requests just because you know everyone is so into different fields right but when you do get requests like yeah I I enjoy them um, I think the thing to remember um, is that like you know talking to somebody who's more senior um, sounds scary right but in in reality like we're humans um, we have our flaws we have good parts of us we're like you right we're not as much we're not as different as one thinks, right? We are very similar in many ways. Um, and I think the other thing to remember is like um, a lot of us in the senior side, we uh, we don't read papers as much anymore. So in some ways you guys are in the forefront of like the science and you guys are reading a lot more papers than us. So you guys are in some ways like are more up to date to them than we are. 
And like anything that you guys have to offer is actually really valuable to us too. So don't think like, you know, you guys are, you know, lower than us. You guys have a lot to offer. And in reality, you guys are the ones who are the upcoming generation, right? So um, you guys are going to be, you know, the at equal college. I mean, you guys already are equal colleagues, but you guys, you know, are going to be at a level where, you know, we have to respect you if we want to ourselves want to move forward, right? So um, it's that kind of reminder is like, we need you guys as much as, you know, you need us, right? We need each other is pretty much what it comes down to. That's awesome. I really like that, David. <laughs> um, okay, let's move on. I think we've got a poll question next. All right, so this is getting into our first topic all about networking. So um, let me launch this second poll. This one is also quick. Just your insight, your thoughts on professional networking. Just your gut reaction. You can only pick one. I'll give you a couple seconds. I'm going to close it in three, two, one. And I like this. There's a big spread. Some people enjoy networking. Some people feel they've never networked before. Some people, it makes them nervous. Um, I'll say if you think you've never networked before, that's probably not true. Um, networking is a lot of things, and we're going to get into that. So um, let's go to the next slide. Okay, so I just pulled this definition from I don't remember where exactly, but networking is the exchange of information or services among individuals, groups, or institutions. Specifically, it's the cultivation of productive relationships for employment or business. But the exchange of information or services. Anytime you talk with a person, through, you know, in-person dialogue, email, um, you're in the same workshop with them, whatever. You're networking probably constantly if you're interacting with other people. So I'm going to ask our panel, when you think of networking now, what does that look like to you? And when you were early on in your career, what did it mean to you? And maybe what were the feelings you had about it? So I'll start with Jamie. I think that now, especially as I as I look ahead to like LPSC, what do I think of? Oh, I need to make sure to talk to this group about this paper that we've got to figure out what to do. And, and then maybe I'd like to talk to this person because they've done field work in this region and I want to figure out what to do next. Or um, that's sort of like I, I'll have a to-do list, but then I also just keep my eyes open for someone. Oh, I never, I never have met that person and they're kind of famous or they're kind of, you know, whatever, I would like to talk to them. And so I'll take the opportunity and, and introduce myself and talk to them briefly for a minute. And there's something everybody will tell you to have ready. That's an elevator speech. We'll probably get to this in a minute, but basically it's just, what if you're trapped in an elevator with somebody and that, you know, they're kind of important and everybody's just riding in silence. You might as well take the chance to say, hi, I'm, you know, I'm so-and-so and this is what I do. Well, I had just been told that and I stepped into an elevator with, um, at the time, I think it was Jim Green, um, head of Planetary Science Division, and uh, and I just I just stood there. I was dead silent. I couldn't do anything. I was like, I know I'm supposed to have an elevator speech, but I think I I'll be too nervous. And then he got out, and I was like, Gosh, I could have. I'm like, I'll do it any minute. No, but someone's going to talk. No, nobody talked. Oh, so anyway, sometimes you'll miss those opportunities, but it's okay. I talked to him later, you know, years later, even, and it was fine. And so just I don't know, just sort of. Um, <laughs> be thinking about what you would say to somebody if you do meet them and be confident about yourself. You've done a lot of work to get to where you are today. And so, you know, you're, and of course you've done work to get to this meeting. And so just being confident, that was sort of off the rails, but anyway, I'll let David go. <laughs> um, so what net does network mean to me? Um, to be honest, um, when I met conferences, networking is a job. It's uh, it's just as important to publish a paper as it is, as it is to network, right? And I want to make sure that, you know, that's really understood that networking is, is should be a top priority when you're at conferences. And a lot of that reason is because um, this is your chance to talk to people. Um, again, that exchange of information that was, that's on the slide, right? Um, you get to talk to people, 
but importantly, like, you know, as you move through your career, um, networking is what helps you get jobs, right? Networking is what helps you get certain collaborations, get on certain missions, you know, and go to wherever your goal is, right? Because in reality, wherever you want to go, whatever you want to research, whatever you want to do, um, you don't do it alone. You always do it with a company of others, right? Everyone supports you. People um, will always help you. So building that network, building that re those relationships with people is what is going to help you to get where you need to go and where you want to go. Um, so I know a lot of people who um, during this, during conferences, they'll be like, oh, I'm going to go to my room and I'm going to go do some work for a little bit. Right. And it's just like, well, you can do work at home. Like you're, you're, you didn't fly like who knows how many miles just to do more work <laughs> alone in a hotel room. You're here to socialize with others because that is a very important aspect. And if you neglect it, it could hurt you. So I, I want to just emphasize networking is very important and it is a job. Um, and when I go to it, that's how I've always seen it. It's always been a job. I may follow up just a little bit on that homework comment. Um, I think I've, I've done this experiment a little bit in my head, like, okay, I really need to do some homework. I need to go in. And so then once in a while, I will have done that and do a little bit of homework. And then I come out and I'll hear about, oh, hey, you know, there was this thing. And then this group went to dinner and then blah, blah, blah. And I thought, oh, I missed that couple of hours. And what did I actually get done in my homework? Nothing spectacular, but that, those couple hours out at that dinner could have been spectacular. So I immediately stopped doing any homework. You can use the airplane for homework or for talk prep or whatever, but, um, and, and maybe you even need to network on the plane because the planes are usually full of LPSC people. So be aware, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I mean, this is a really great opportunity. And so treat that week as really precious time spent, whatever it is, and go, go hunt it down, go look in the bars, go look in the, you know, and I know some people aren't as comfortable in bars, but it's really a friendly place when it's LPSC because there's lots of variety of people in those places and doing different things. Not everybody's drinking or whatever. They're just, they're talking in a big mass and it's just great to be with everybody. Thank you, that's super helpful. And I totally identify with missing out because I went to work on other things. I was at a conference where um, the major talking point was during one of the afternoon sessions, the fire alarm went off and it was chaos in the conference area. Everyone was fine, but I was at my hotel and then later people were, did you hear about the fire alarm? No, I missed it. Anyway, we'll move on to the next slide and we're gonna go through a couple quick things. Um, so there are some misconceptions about networking. So sometimes we think of it as just small talk or socializing. Sometimes we think of it as just a practiced pitch and it has to be to the right people. Um, there's also kind of this perception that might only be for extroverts, people who really want to be social all the time, um, or that it's a one-time interaction. Well, I gave my pitch to the right person, and now I've done my networking. Um, and finally, that you might have to be in a position where you have something to offer. And none of these are true. There's bits of all of these that might be a little true. So the truth about networking, and again, not exhaustive, but it's that networking is a lifelong practice and a lifelong goal to build up the people in your network, the people that you interface with. Networking will change as you progress through your profession. And it's important to be true to yourself and be true to your values. Um, most people have experienced discomfort while they network at some point, that's okay. It happens, you move on. Um, but it should be something that supports your goals and aligns with your personality. So if you need breaks, you take breaks. If you're comfortable in small groups, seek out small groups. If you're comfortable with larger groups, do that. But there's no right way. It's important that the way you interact with people aligns with your personality. That will yield the best results. Let's go to the next one. Okay, so what do I talk about? So you wanna have a conversation. I love the idea of like, you should have a practiced explanation of who you are, why you're at the conference, what you do, what you're interested in, because people will want to know that and you don't wanna be stumped at that question. <laughs> but after you get through that, 
it's about having a conversation. So you can look for commonalities with people, starting with the fact that you're at the same conference. Um, and it's it's not only about you sharing. You should be a good listener. You should ask questions. Find out what the other person is working on and what they're excited to see at the conference and so on. Um, David or Janie, do you have any go-tos for like starting a cold conversation with somebody that you don't know? This is a hard one for me. So <laughs> if you don't understand. I, I, okay, I'll go first because this okay. one is, I have a strategy to this one and this is a strategy I've been using and it's worked very well for me since um, I started. Um, and, it, and it takes years to develop, but um, basically my strategy is uh, everybody in, in uh, LPSC is connected to each other in one way or another, right? And um, one, one of my rules that I have when I go to conferences is that I don't hang out with people from my institute. I see them 52 weeks a year. I don't need to add, you know, like, or 51. I don't need to add one more, right? So, um, but what I will do is, you know, maybe I know one or two people, right, in the beginning. I might know one, two people from other institutions. And what I will do is a lot of other people love to hang out with people within their own institutions, right? Especially like other graduate students. So the advantage is you go hang out with that friend who's hanging out with people at their institute and you get to know them, right? So now you've went from two to now like five people that you know. And every time you see them at conferences, walk by, you just wave hot. You don't have to stop and talk to them. And sometimes you can, um, and you kind of start building that network, right? So now you know you now you know them, and they're connected to some other people, and you you get to know the people that they're connected to, and it includes sometimes they include their advisors, and that advisor might be that person that you really want to talk to, who's kind of a star in in planetary that you want to talk to, right? So you grow this network by hanging out with people who are at other institutes because they know people who you're going to get to know. And it just grows and grows from there. And that's kind of how I grew my network was I took advantage of that. And when you talk to people, you don't have to like, just talk about science. <laughs> I'm actually probably really guilty of this. I, I would talk about guilt, uh, science for a good probably five minutes before I'll be like, how's your life going? How's your family doing? How's like, how's school? Like I just easily get into that personal conversation because once you get into that personal conversation, that's where you kind of start building that friendship. And when you start building that friendship, you, you know, you're gonna remember each other um, for a long time um, and they might help and they will end up help, helping you or you may be helping them in the future. Um, so the way I start those cold conversation is basically you go to somebody that you know, who's talking to somebody who you don't know. And it could be also be somebody from your institute, right? And, and, and you get to know them. And, and they will always introduce you to them, right? Um, and that's, and basically you just get, start to get involved in their conversation and you jump in when you can. So instead of having to come up with an idea of how to like, how do I introduce myself? How do I do these things? Let other people do that for you. Um, and that is basically, I think the key to doing it. I love that. I love seeing that one person in a big group and you're like, who's this person? Look how brave they are just going out with all the rest of us and they don't know who we are but pretty soon we know we know them and it's it works out really great that's a that's a neat strategy usually if i'm if i'm just kind of out in the hall and i don't know what to do i will do a feels creepy but i'll kind of slide in and just sort of stand at a good distance but listen and then try to just you know offer some things as soon as i be like oh yeah well i blah 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 or i heard about this aspect of that research or something and usually you'll be pulled in, not always. Sometimes people really just want their one-on-one, -on -one, so you'll try and then you might have to leave and that's okay. But um, but yeah, I find that that works out well. You just kind of slide around from group to group. And and I love being around people. I can be a little shy sometimes, but I still can make that work just by doing that. Just listen in and see. Um, and I, I will say there's one kind of interesting story that just came to me. Um, you feel like it's hard in the beginning and it, it is. Um, so first of all, think of this group as a group that you're really going to love after a while. And you may not know that right now, but think of some other group that took you a while to learn how to love. And once you got to that point, you can't imagine thinking of them like any other way. So, so yeah, I mean, you will get to that point with, with everybody as soon as you put that time in. And as David said, you're asking 
about their own personal lives and their experiences, that's what helps you like love each other and build a good, a good rapport. And I feel like our field does that very well. Um, but as you get farther along, you've got a big history behind you and some things may happen and some difficulties may arise. And so you might find yourself in some of the most difficult networking you've had to do, which is to try to like repair some relationships that have been built for whatever reason. So I, again, like put that work in and just try. I found that I did that in one case, went to a meeting and I saw this person. I thought, oh, this is going to be rough, um, but I really want to try. So I just went up to them and there was another person who said, hey, do you guys have lunch plans? And kind of thought, are they going to say no way? But no, they didn't. They said, yeah, let's go. Let's go. And I kind of could feel it healing during that time. And it's just because you go to the meetings, you put in the work and, and you get it back. So it's important time spent. Yeah. And I think I want to add, um, I just, this occurred to me, um, when you meet people for the first time and you meet them again, um, don't feel awkward if they're, first thing they're doing is their eye goes straight to your name tag. Even if you've known them for like 10 years, their name always goes straight to your name tag. I don't understand. It, it's, it's, it's really funny, but it's, you know, and it's, it really does help people remember like who you are and where you're at. So um, I think the one thing I would add to the strategy that I was talking about is once you know them, add them on like whatever in social media you have. <laughs> My our generation's Facebook. I know TikTok's kind of in now and Instagram. So um, don't be afraid to add these people on social networking um, sites just because honestly, that's how they solidify and remember your name and your face forever. So um, it really does work. And Pretty much, I'm not on social media that much, but I literally use it for my job and that's pretty much it. Yeah. I, I think COVID helped us because I try to help people now when I go up, oh, hi, it's Janie. And a lot of times you're like, of course I know it's Janie, but then sometimes, you know, uh, cause we had a mask on for so long, it was hard to tell. So I'd say, oh, hi, it's Janie, you know, um, but that's helpful to just help people because yeah, I get a panic too. Like, oh gosh, how can I look at their name tag? I've got, you know, I've been thinking about that for 10 minutes. How do I glance at it without them knowing? So that can be hard. I, I will admit there was one person that I have met in the past and I, I introduced myself to them again and they're like, yeah, we know each other. And I was like, oh, no, Oops. <laughs> mistakes happen. It's okay. You meet a lot of people at once and you only see them once a year. So it does happen. So don't feel afraid bad if you uh, <laughs> forgot you met somebody before. <laughs> oh yeah. I readily admit to people that I'm terrible with names I'm good with faces. I'm bad at matching up the names. It's not you, it's me. <laughs> I think most people are very forgiving of that. <laughs> um, so this is great advice. Let's move to the next slide, which I think mostly summarizes what we've just talked about. Um, so you're gonna probably, you're gonna feel some imposter syndrome, especially early on. Um, but it's all about just putting yourself out there. As our panelists have said, it gets easier as you go on, as you make more connections. Um, but something you can do to help get over that discomfort, if you're feeling it, is to define some goals um, and then prepare to meet them, to communicate them. Um, think of questions that you want to ask because your voice is really important at conferences, even if you are, you know, it's your first time there. That doesn't matter. It's really important to have early researchers. Um, and like David said, networking can be professional. It can also be personal. If you and the other people you're with are comfortable with it, that can be a really nice relief sometimes to come out of lots and lots of science and just socialize with people. It doesn't always have to be, you know, about research or about professional topics. Um, so what we can do is um, it, on the topic of making goals, um, think about the kinds of connections that you want to make um, and how you could go about doing them. Do you want to meet your peers, people who are at a similar level as you, um, or maybe people who are more advanced in their careers? Um, do you want it to be a one-time interaction? You just want to introduce yourself, or maybe you want to set up something a little bit more long-term. You could speak with them about having a meeting in the future. Um, preparing specific goals can help you as you define your own value and share it with others. 
So this is a little bit what's on here. You can think about some networking goals. Do you want to be, do you want to have interactions that are spontaneous or planned? If they're planned, then you're probably going to need to do some work ahead of time, setting up meetings, looking at people's talks, figuring out where you need to be. Um, think about how to align your goals with your professional or research goals. Um, you don't have to just speak with people who might have an opportunity for you, but it's still good could be good to speak with people in the field or doing the kind of work you want to be doing. And then make sure the goals that you set are specific and achievable. Um, it's easy to say, my goal for this conference is to network with everybody who works on this Rover team or something like that. You know, I wanna to talk to 50 different people. That's probably a little bit ambitious and could be difficult to achieve. So think about really specific and achievable goals so that you can tell when you've been successful. Um, and then finally, think about what you're bringing, what you could share with a person, even if it's, you know, that you're just really enthusiastic about their work and you want to learn more. That's awesome. Um, but think about that and how you're going to share it with the person you speak to. So I think after this, we have a, yes, thank you, Christine. We've got a quick write. So this is another one where I'm going to give folks about a minute um, on your own. You don't have to share in the chat, but on your own, think about what is one of your goals, a networking goal for LPSC or your, your next upcoming science conference. All right, so we're at a minute, um, but I'd really encourage you all to keep thinking about what your goals are. It's really helpful to set them ahead of time, and later after the conference, you can um, evaluate if you met those goals and if you didn't, how you could change your strategy for the next conference. Christine? Okay, so we've kind of gone through this already. So I'll just summarize. You want to familiarize yourself with the program. Reach out to people you might be interested in meeting with. Um, provide some context for yourself. To help them know who you are and what you might be interested in talking about. It's okay to ask for help and to buddy up with people who you do know, like David suggested, um, especially if those people have more connections, have different connections, might be more comfortable in certain situations. Um, there are not exhibitors at LPSC this year, but at other conferences or in the future, that's also a great place to get your feet wet with networking because exhibitors are there to meet conference attendees. They're excited to have a conversation with anybody and they've got a lot of information that they want to share. So just something to keep in mind in the future, if you need to just get a little practice going up and talking with new people, exhibitors can be a great place to start. Set your own boundaries. If you need a little bit of time by yourself, that's okay. It's okay to eat lunch alone. It's okay to go back to your hotel room and decompress for a second. You don't have to be on the whole time. A conference is a marathon, not a sprint. Um, and then make sure you're spending time around people who support and encourage you. Um, those are the folks that even if they might not be in the exact professional position to get you where you wanna go, those are the people you want in your network. And so look for those folks who are encouraging and who advocate for you. I think 
we are, oh, last step in networking. And then we're gonna take questions. Okay, so <clears throat> the last step is networking doesn't end with the conference. If you had a valuable connection with a person, do what was suggested by David, add them on social media, send them a follow-up email if you had a really meaningful discussion. Um, try to plan to meet with them at other conferences or workshops. And you can also you know, follow up with meetings virtually, maybe in person. And particularly if you talked about data or they assisted you in some way, you can share your publications or your presentations with them in the future. Um, but it's important to follow up, right? Keep nursing those connections and building them to be stronger. Okay, so at this point, if people have any questions about networking, we're going to address them now. We can come back and talk about networking in the second Q&A. But for now, if folks have questions about networking, you can put them in the chat or in the Q&A. Um, and then we'll move on to talking about presentations. So we have one question in the Q&A right now that I'm going to read. Um, this one says, I'm in the process of switching labs away from an abusive advisor. And the work that I did with this person is what I'm presenting at the conference. I'm terrified that they will do everything in their power to sabotage me at the conference. How do I protect myself? So this is a really tough situation and a hard question. Um, but advice, uh, David or Jamie? Uh, this is definitely <laughs> reaching out to the therapy side of myself. Um, <laughs> give me a second to think about this one for a second. Um, I could I could speak while you're thinking, David, if you want. I I, I read this a little bit ago. I've been thinking. Um, I'm really sorry you're in this situation. First of all, that's a really rough place to be in. I've had a number of colleagues who have been in the same kind of situation. One who battled that for a number of years, and uh, she's doing very well now in the field. And so, uh, I hope you feel like there is going to be a good way forward for you. Um, what I also witnessed is that, well, so first of all, it doesn't go very well for senior people if they come down hard on junior people in talks or in poster sessions. If they're, if they're socially unaware enough that they do that, um, just recognize that everybody else around them knows this is a bad idea and will sympathize with you. And so it's gonna be a matter possibly of just getting through that, but I still feel like it's unlikely they're going to do something publicly to you like in Q and A or whatever. Um, and then also what you might find is once you're away from that lab, the two of you will suddenly have a very different relationship and you, and hopefully one that's, you know, first of all, you, you just want distance from them anyway. Um, but they may start treating you as a colleague, which will be a very strange thing to see, but interesting for you. Um, and so all I'm saying is that things just may improve on that, on that end anyway. Um. Yeah, I, I'm I'm very sorry that you're experiencing this. This is um, not acceptable behavior on their part that they may be, you know, sabotaging you and, you know, trying to put you in this position, um, which fuels all sorts of, you know, issues, mental health issues that, you know, that would even come up for me if, if I had to experience something like this. So what you're going through is definitely very, it's not, it's not easy. It's not, it's, that's it, yeah. It's a it's a heavy burden that you're feeling. Um, and I think the first thing I want to say is you are welcome to come talk to me um, at the conference. Um, I will be happy to talk to you. Um, I am connected with people who you know we take this type of stuff, this type of bullying, very seriously. Right? Being bullied is not acceptable in any form, and and thankfully, you know a lot of people in the field are now taking that more seriously and we are being less tolerant of it, right? We're not going to let that fly. Um, so you are welcome to talk to me about it um, more if you'd like. Um, but when it comes to just, you know, switching uh, labs, um, people under, I, I've seen people do that all the time. Um, I've seen it um, at my Institute where people have done things like this. Um, due to somebody who is um, kind of a bully 
And at the end, um, people who switch, like they, they tend to do a lot better um, because they usually find somebody who's supportive, somebody who is willing to help them, uh, somebody who understands their predicament and what they're going through. So, um, and I, and yeah, so just note that, you know, that abusiveness is not acceptable. Um, and you are, and there are a lot of people who will support you and um, willing to help you in any way that we can. Um, so you're welcome to bother me um, at the conference. Don't, don't even hesitate. So that's the best I can really offer for now. <laughs> thank you both. And thank you to the attendee who shared that question um, for, for being so vulnerable and honest about, you know, the experience that you're worried about having at the conference. I hope that that is not the case and that you have um, a positive, productive, supportive experience. And I'd say if you just have other folks in your network who can build you up while you're there, who can, you know, be on the lookout for you. Um, and, um, and hopefully, you know, the process of switching labs will, will be a massive improvement. Um, oh, and Christine just shared in the chat, there's a code of conduct for the meeting. And um, that is a very serious code of conduct. So that is something else to consider as a, a resource to protect you. You know, one thing you could consider is um, chatting with the session chairs ahead of time and just alerting them to this possibility that somebody might come and, you know, try to take over question session for your talk if it's a talk. If it's a poster, uh, maybe the same thing is in place. I'm forgetting if they're poster session chairs, but but anyway, the you could just say, look, this might happen. And if, if you're an alert session chair, you'll say, hey, we're, we don't have time, but we're gonna cut you off. Here we go, <laughs> we're going to the next. So anyway, that's just a strategy that, that could be used in your behalf. Yeah, that, that is a great strategy. Um, yeah, let, you know, let people know that who can, and, you know, protect you, maybe somebody who is senior because, um, you know, they can speak out um, and, and stop it from happening, right? And that's what we want it, want to do is, is kind of prevent it from having them start. And I think the session share is a good idea if you have a talk. Um, if you have a poster, you know, let somebody know and, you know, you can have at least one person who may be in the vicinity to make sure if this person shows up, um, we can address it immediately. All right. Well, thank you. Um, okay, we've got one more question about networking. It just came through the Q&A. So before we move on, we'll address this one. Um, so this one says, months ago, I abruptly ended my collaboration with a scientist on a research project due to diverging research interests. Since then, I haven't had any communication with them through email. As the conference approaches, I'm wondering how to network with them as my first impulse is to avoid them altogether. I feel like if there's some way for you just to try to talk to them, whether if you feel it's easier to do this before LPSC, just send a quick email, hi. I know things have been a little rough between us. I, do hope to see you at LPSC and, and I will say hi, you know, something like that. Or if it's easier for you to wait, maybe when you see them, I would honestly make that effort now. And, and the reason is just, you're gonna see each other, you'll circle each other for 20, 30, 40 years, you know, and you might even forget why you're not talking to each other after that amount of time, when it's just easier, better for both to try to repair. And, and if you're the one trying and they're not ready to accept it, well, then you you have at least made the, the effort and you'll feel better about having tried. And maybe you can try again later or something like that, but it's better for you than to let that fester, I feel like. Yeah, I agree with Jane, what Janie said. Um, it's, if you, yeah, I mean, it really depends on what you, what you really want, right? That's, I think that's where it is important. What do you want? And if one of the things that you would want is to, you know, rebuild this uh, relationship with them, you know, Jamie's right, just, you know, send them an email being like, you know, this did happen. Um, I acknowledge that this happened and, you know, I am willing to move on and, you know, try to rework some type of collaboration or work 
uh, together again. Um, but remember, it really comes down because I mean we don't know the <laughs> what's everything that's going on within it. You know, the, you know we're getting you know an idea of things are that are happening, but we don't know the specifics. Um, but you know, really comes down to what is what is important to you and, and what is the objective and building that uh, relationship uh, again. Um, is it important to you? Is it something that you need? Um, so th these are some of the think, questions to kind of consider. I think those are great. And it's, yeah, not to let this become something bigger than it might be. Um, and to move forward. And, you know, in some case, maybe kind of be the bigger person and to let that go. And this could potentially be, a, you know, a productive relationship in the future. Um, but at the very least, it could be a neutral one. Um, okay, so I think that was it for the Q&A for right now. If you have other questions about networking, feel free to put them in. We're going to have open Q&A in a little bit here. Um, okay, so we're going to move on now to talking about presentations. Christine, can we go to the next slide? Thank you. Okay, so this is just the information about oral presentations. All of this is online at that link at the bottom. Um, but just a quick reminder, if you're presenting at LPSC, your files have to be submitted by March 8th. You're going to be given a 10-minute speaking slot with warnings after eight minutes. Try not to go over time. That's the most uncomfortable. Um, and then there will be panel Q&A sessions um, after multiple presentations, and those sessions will last 20 to 25 minutes. So just a couple key points, in-person presenters, your slides are gonna be shared on a conference computer, not your personal laptop. You will be advancing the slides with a remote clicker, um, and you will be required to wear a microphone. So just don't be caught off guard by that. Um, and think about what you dress for. Um, certain materials, um, you know, shapes of clothing can be easier to attach the lapel mic. Um, people with long hair, sometimes the microphone will interfere with your hair and you'll get a bunch of annoying feedback. You don't want to have to be dealing with that while you're up there giving your talk. So things to have in mind ahead of time. For remote presenters, your slides are also going to be shared on the conference computer. So a session chair is going to be advancing the slides for you when you say next slide. Keep that in mind when you are organizing your slides so you don't put a whole ton of animations in there. Because otherwise you might be having to go next, 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 or you know, arrows and circles to pop up. So things to keep in mind. Um, and your presentation slides and your video will be shared live in the session room. So um, I think we can move on to the next slide. Okay, so a couple of tips for everybody. Um, practice, practice your presentation, practice with your cat, with your roommate, uh, in the mirror, um, with a timer. <laughs> Um, keep in mind where you need to be um, at a certain time point in order to get through your talk. It's always the conclusions and the implications that get squished and cut, and that's the last thing you want to have happen. So make sure you're emphasizing the significance of your work during the Q&A um, at your poster or during a talk. It's okay to say, I don't know, if you don't know. Um, you can ask you know, to speak with the person afterward and get more information if you need it. Um, but it's okay to not know the answer to something. Dress comfortably and confidently. Simplify your message, less is more. Always remember to explain your figures. Uh, and if you've put it on the, on the slide or on your poster, you need to address it and you need to talk about the axes. Um, Small things include your scale bars and your captions. Um, make sure you consider accessibility. And there's lots of available resources online about font sizes, color schemes, all kinds of stuff. But you don't want to be alienating people in your audience just because you didn't consider it. Um, and that goes along with showing respect for your audience. Being professional, be passionate, let your enthusiasm come through. 
and practice. <laughs> okay, so those are just overall tips. Um, I'm gonna just, let's go to the next slide. So um, this is probably pretty rudimentary. I'm sure all of you are beyond this, but let's say you're struggling to put together a presentation. It can be really helpful to think of your presentation as a narrative. So you're not just taking a research paper or your abstract and translating it onto a poster or into a talk. Um, try to build a story out of it. Giving a presentation is a really unique opportunity to share your resource and it's a completely different format from other ones. So don't try to squeeze the paper onto the slides um, or onto the poster. Instead, you can try to organize your story the way that a narrative would. So the first step might be the call to action. This is your motivation. What are the questions that are driving you? And then second is your quest. What approach did you take to answer those questions? What are the challenges that arose? Next, you move on to the outcome. Was your quest successful? What did it reveal? The revelations are what have you learned and what are the impacts? And then you could end with what's next. And this will lead itself back around. Um, so I'll just ask panel, any thoughts about tips for presenters or overall structure getting started on presentations? I assume most folks are probably comfortable getting to this stage so we, we can move on. But if you've got some thoughts, I'd love to hear them. Um, I really like this little circle to share your story. I, I find that I am always telling my students, I need a story. Please tell me a story about this so that I care about, about what it is. I mean, uh, I actually had a conversation once with my colleague and he's like, well, this is about, you know, chondrites. And so they're, everybody's going to care. And I was like, this, this audience is like, you know, mechanics in Antarctica. They, they don't care about chondrites, I promise you. But why? Of course they would care about them. So anyway, it is hard to sort of help everybody see why your ideas are so important. And so try, especially at this stage, usually as you're just um, heading out, trying to tell the big picture, present it in the big picture is, is important and is, um, is good. And, and one thing I try to do, one thing I always do still is I run through my whole talk um, and, and a couple times, usually the first time I give it, I'm taking a while because I'm stumbling through my words but it helps me look at all my slides and make sure everything is good. And then I'll go through it again, make sure it's okay for time. But I used to do that, oh, I don't know, 10, 15 times when I was first starting out because it's a new skill and you have to learn it and you have to build it. And so be willing to take that time. And I used to write out my first two sentences on a card because if I could read those two sentences, I would get myself calm enough that I could then go on and speak to the slides and not be nervous. Um, and so, yeah, so just as, as was mentioned, practice and practice yeah there is no substitute for the practicing um you have to practice um it doesn't matter like how long you we've been in the field we still practice like you cannot get away from not practicing right um because you have to know what's on your slides what's going to come up next or some main ideas that you want to talk about right because when you do give a talk you, you still have goals right your goals is to emphasize certain concepts um, or certain results. So practicing is, is so important. And I do understand like if you do go up and give a talk and you, you practice a million times, you always stumble in that first minute <laughs> because you're just kind of like, you know, that anxiety mixed with, um, with your practice gets involved. So what I usually do in that first minute is I start with something that you just can't mess up, something so easy that it's just like, you know, it's just an intro, right? You can't, you can't screw up introductions, right? Like, hey, everybody, you know, good morning, right? As simple as that is a good way to get rid of that anxiety and then move straight into your, what you've been rehearsing the entire time. So practice is very important. And then just start with something, you know, like I said, something easy. Um, and then the last thing I want to emphasize is the whole, like, um, I am colorblind, so if you put certain colors together, yeah, I just, I just, usually at the talk, I'm just like, I just get a little frustrated because, you know, I hear the speaker saying, oh, the red circle over here. I'm like, what red circle? Because I'm colorblind, right? So <laughs> if you have a, if you're showing a map and it's gray, use some yellow. <laughs> that helps. Don't use red. Um, so yeah, think about that. 
Thank you. And like both of you, yeah, I practice the very first words that are going to come out of my mouth. I'll write them down. Good morning. Because I know if I leave it up to me, I'll get up there and I'll go, good evening. Uh, oh, wait, it's 9 a.m. Oh, God, I've already started off on. So <laughs> you can be very prepared. Um, it might seem trivial, but if you're especially at the beginning, write it down, practice it, and then also practice those transitions between slides. I think that's the easiest place to get mixed up. Um, and I even had a, a classmate who would label each slide with a question so that if she got stuck, she would read the question. So what were the results? Okay, right, the results were. Um, so you can look for tricks like that as well. Okay, so we've got an activity next. Christine, can we go to the next slide? Okay, so this is a another quick write. You're gonna give be given a minute um, to compose a short message. It says 140 or less, but try to just keep it to a sentence. Basically, a short message that answers what is the fundamental message that you want to deliver. If people could come away from your presentation, poster or talk, with one sentence, short sentence, what is it? So please take a minute. Okay, so once you have your fundamental message that you really want to communicate, you can build your presentation around that. All the things that are on your slides and your poster should be vehicles to communicate that message. So you can also workshop what the message is. So for instance, if you, just as an example, say, I want people to come away knowing that I mapped clay minerals on Mars. You could maybe rework that to large areas of Mars experienced rainfall over thousands of years. If that is what your research shows, for instance, like that's a lot more motivating. So you can workshop what that message is so that it's really uh, sticks with people and makes your research really exciting. Let's go to the next question or the next slide. Okay, basically said this, we can keep moving, but that message can help bring people into your presentation and then also can be the take home that they go with. Um, so structuring your presentation, you wanna think about how you're gonna bring people in, um, how you're gonna provide context and make them care about what it is that you're gonna be presenting. Um, highlight the gap that you're addressing and then you're sharing what you've done and that should be you know, easy for you to talk about and hopefully be really enthusiastic about. It's all the stuff you've worked on and the questions you've answered. And then you really want to end with explaining, you know, providing examples of the significance of your work. Um, let's go to the next slide. So this is just a quick overview. These are actually... Um, you can get into a lot more detail if you want to look these up, but some ways to provide context, because sometimes the background section of a presentation can eat up a lot of time, or it can be skipped over. And both of those are difficult for the audience. You want to be able to provide enough background that people know why you're asking what you're asking, why it matters, why they should care. Um, so there's a couple different strategies. The first one is called cycling, where you basically circle your topic, 
and repeatedly get closer and closer down to the question that you're asking. So if you were studying something on Mars, you know, you could basically provide, this is the planet I'm working on. These are the tools I'm using. This is what similar research has done. And you get down to your focus area. You can do that pretty quickly. Similarly, if you have a research project that is distinctive in some way from something else that's quite recognizable, you could do um, a strategy called fencing, which is where you define your topic by drawing comparisons with other topics. So if you're working on a mission that's maybe very new, but it's got a similar kind of um, goal or um, instrument as a well-known mission, you could compare it to that one. And then finally, people sometimes zone out a bit. Um, it's really useful to provide verbal punctuation. These are basically places where you're inviting the zoned out members of your audience to jump back in. So let's say you were going through your results section and it was maybe a little bit difficult for people who aren't in your exact subfield to understand. It's okay when you get to your significance to say, okay, basically we, we're coming back up to a broader scope now. Please like join me basically for the conclusions or the implications. But so providing a verbal and visual punctuation of like, if you, if you missed out on the last section, you can come back in here. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Um, I have been violating this rule the whole time, but choose visuals that illustrate and amplify your story because if it's on your slide, you should talk about it. I've just had pretty visuals on my slides. <laughs> But if you're giving a presentation for a science conference and you have a visual on your slide, you should use it. I really love this quote from Emily Lakawala. She says, PowerPoint, like any other means of projecting visual content, is a tool. And like any tool, it can be used for good or evil. So you want your PowerPoints to be engaging, but you don't want them to be distracting. Make sure that the elements you have on the slides are meaningful. Okay, we're going to go to the next slide and then we're going to get some discussion. Okay, so don't go over time. Fill your slides with text. Use excessive uh, jargon or acronyms. Don't point out your faults. This is something I'm guilty of. If I like pause for a second because I forgot where I was or I stumble over my words, I will audibly call out that I made a mistake. That it doesn't matter. It's fine. Just you stumbled over your words, correct them and move on. Not a big deal. Um, don't rely on features that might not work. If one of your slides, what, some important part of your talk absolutely won't come across if such and such video doesn't play, be prepared that it might not, right? Be prepared that something might display ineffectively and have at least a plan B for how you could still talk about it. You don't wanna to be totally disrailed because of maybe a technical issue. Um, don't display data tables. Try not to speak too quickly or too quietly. Practicing will help. And again, something I've been violating, don't read from your slides. <laughs> Try to just put key points on your slide, but you shouldn't have full sentences and you probably should not be reading from the slide. Um, okay, so we've covered a bunch of stuff just now. I wanna open it up to just general input, advice, thoughts from the panel, and then we're, we're gonna get into the Q&A in just a minute here. Okay, well, so I'm actually, I'm gonna ask, um, so, Janie, first off, have you been guilty of any of these before? Oh yeah, <laughs> probably, <laughs> probably all of them actually at one point or another. Um, but you you sort of learn by doing those things and then failing. So it's good that you don't, you might not have to learn because you're being told already these we've tried and these things don't work. Um, I think it is really important not to go over time. I noticed this, that I just start to lose, to tune out. If it goes over, my brain is already calibrated for that 10 minutes. If it goes over that, then I, 
I get nervous and oh, what is going on? What's going to happen with the next talk? And I stop listening. So not only have you like violated that, but you've lost me. I'm not listening anymore and I get angry. So um, it's good to just aim for that time. And anyway, nowadays, because we do the Q and A at the very end, it's very metered out and you can't just go into your own Q and A time. So it's, it's a little harder to, to go out to go over that. Um, I, I think I agree with this rule about data tables. I think that you probably never ever should put a data table because you don't have time to digest it. A table is for you to take time and look and then compare and to look. So instead you need to tell people through a visual, through a chart, through uh, even just tell them through words, these are bigger than these, you know, and here's a picture of one of them and the, the other next to each other for scale. And that's a lot better way to do it. Um, I really love figures and the bigger, the better. So don't let PowerPoint tell you it should be in this tiny box off to the side expand it to the full width of the page and then put a little bit of text off to the side. That's what I like to see the best. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess there's not really much left to say. I think Janie really covered it. Yeah, I mean, we've, we've done a lot of these. Um, I think the time is the most important because the uh, those the session chairs will come after you if you go if you go a little bit too far. Um, they, they will literally start to stand up and uh, and scold you so don't try you know try to be within the time right <laughs> um, but otherwise i mean yeah i think these yeah everything that needs to be said has been said um just remember there's only so much that people digest i mean think about it when you go to your talk how much do you come out with it you don't you can't recreate the talk you come out with maybe a sentence or two about what that talk was about so um you know you don't need data tables and you don't need super long small text on each slide you just need like a sentence key points right so yeah um yeah well i'm glad to know that it's not just me i compiled this slide from a lot of advice from from different articles and things and i was well i've done all of these i think except going over time because i'm one of the folks that starts speaking very very quickly when she's giving a presentation. And so I find out that I was under time, but that's a different problem. <laughs> uh, Christine, could we go to the next slide? Uh, oh, and then let's say if you're doing a virtual presentation, you just have a couple other things to keep in mind. You're gonna prepare your own studio. You want it to look as professional as possible. Um, test your microphone, make sure you're comfortably dressed secure the cat or the dog um, for the, the minutes you'll be presenting. Um, think about ways that you can increase your virtual presence, good lighting, you know, um, being uh, illustrated, moving around. Um, and then just make sure that you don't distract from your own story on, on your slides or as a presenter. For instance, um, if you're nervous and you're holding a laser pointer, a lot of times that can become very distracting because it can be shaking all around, moving very rapidly. And the people in the audience are like cats just watching the laser pointer instead of seeing your slide. So it can be tricky, but make sure that you don't do things that could detract from your own presentation. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Okay, and then I think this is one of the most important, but one of the trickiest things to do is when you get to the end, you just have to end. And you don't want to end with thank you. You don't want your final slide to say thank you or questions or to be your acknowledgements or your funding sources. You want your final slide to be your conclusions, your implications, maybe that takeaway sentence or future work. You also wanna make sure you, on the final slide, display your name. People could find it, but don't make them go looking for it. Display your name, um, contact information, website, whatever you might be comfortable with sharing right at the end there. Someone who might be really excited about your results and conclusions could just be jotting it down. Um, and then this is tricky, but <laughs> I love this quote too. Begin at the beginning and go on till you get to the end, then stop. Once you're done, just say thank you and leave. I have a hard time doing this. I go, um, well, so I guess that's it. Um, okay. It's the last words out of your mouth in strong and confident. Um, 
and leave those important take home messages up on the final slide. Okay. Think of that thank you as a mic drop, which basically. Thank yeah. <laughs> and then that's it. Yeah, I like a good beefy conclusion slide because that's what everybody gets to stare at for a minute while you're getting off the stage and you know everything's transitioning. So let them digest that. All right, so let's go to the next slide. Okay, so these are just final take home messages, things to remember. Humans only have one language processor. So you don't wanna be talking about something that's totally different than what you're displaying on your slide or on your poster when you're talking about it. Um, people will either be reading and looking at what's on your poster or listening to you. So you want those things to be complementary. Um, slides are a tool for supporting your presentation. They are not in lieu of a presentation. Um, so you can rely really heavily on images and on short bits of text, but it shouldn't be everything you're gonna say all on the, the slides. You wanna try to present just one idea per slide. This can be really hard for a short presentation. Um, but less is more, and your audience will be able to extract more of the information if it's really concise. And then do what you can to connect with your audience. So make sure you're not looking at the screen or looking down at notes. Um, making eye contact with people can be a little bit intimidating sometimes, but just look toward your audience, be engaged, be present, um, and that will also go a long way in keeping them engaged. Okay, so we're gonna open up now for Q&A for the rest of the time. And um, any other you know, thoughts or uh, anecdotes from our panelists are also totally welcome at this point. Um, but yes, any other questions, please put them in the chat or into the Q&A. And I'm gonna post the resources one more time. I will say if you decide to put a joke in your talk, limit to like one or two jokes and make sure they're hard hitters. <laughs> uh, you don't want a joke that goes flat. <laughs> it just doesn't work out. Yeah, I'm always so impressed by people who can land a joke in that situation, I'm always so nervous. And I've had people recommend to me like, oh, well, tell a joke or like be self-deprecating. Like, oh no, it just comes across as like very awkward if I do it. Or sad. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. So yeah, it's all about staying true to yourself. Um, find what works for you. Uh, I love it if someone can lift me with a little bit of humor, but I recognize that's not one of my skill sets. <laughs> I like this idea of letting your slides help you instead of uh, run you because I really do rely a lot on my slides. I think that, you know, images are, are so important. My student last year did not submit his talk in time for the LPI deadline. They take this very seriously, by the way. So they said, well, I'm sorry, you have a 10 minute slot, but you can't present any slides. <laughs> so I said, withdraw, withdraw, don't do it. And he's like, no, I think I'll do it. And he stood up and he spoke for 10 minutes in front of a blank screen and it was it was pretty amazing everybody came up after they're like oh my gosh that was so good and good job and you know and he gained this anon uh, whatever uh something itity uh anyway notoriety? there we go notoriety and uh it worked out great for him so that might be something to practice just in case something like that happens to you and i will say i mean i'm sure a lot of people have anxiety with giving talks um you know everyone's always supportive of you at the end um the only time like no like no one says anything bad. No one comes after you. No one has died after a talk um, that has been in the history of LP LPSC. No one has died from their talks or anything like that or got injured. But um, no, it, you know, people are just supportive. The I mean, the only time you would ever receive backlash is, is if you targeted a person or someone's paper, right? Because that's obviously because you're going aggressive. But Otherwise, like people are very supportive and kind and you're going to be surprised how many senior scientists will come up to you and just be like, wow, that was really good because a lot of senior scientists are very supportive of graduate students and people who are early in their career. Um, 
and you know and that's something i do love about this field is how supportive people who are um much further in their career and how much they support the younger people so it's a it's a very good positive field Oh, yes. Thank you, Christine. And remember to have fun. And um, we've got some of the resources here. So just a reminder, this uh, webinar was recorded and um, it's available on the YouTube, uh, the LPI YouTube channel. And um, additional resources are also available at this link. So this includes um, articles and recorded videos about all kinds of stuff that we addressed today. Um, and we do have some questions. Okay, so someone at, oh, one of them just, I just answered it. So it disappeared into answered, but yeah, feel oh, free okay. to read it. Yeah, but um, it's weird how that works, that Q&A. Um, I'll, I'll answer the one that's currently open um, just because I don't like to type things out. Um, so yeah, what if, so the person asked, what if we kind of, are targeted a paper that is my research has proven and accepted and published paper um, and does not to not be scientifically sound. Okay, from what I understand from your um, question is usually people don't go out of their way to like go after somebody else. Um, most times is because people don't. I mean, if you're gonna give a talk, you want to let give people your message, right? So going after somebody else doesn't really help them deliver their message. So most times people don't really target other people or their paper. Um, it does happen very, very rarely. It does not happen all that often at all. Um, so it's, and it, and if it did happen to you, um, it's, you know, doesn't mean everybody in the crowd believes it and doesn't, and most people, when they see it, they don't like it. They, they notice when people are going after somebody else and people do not like that because it's just not, I mean, it's just, it's just not a cool thing to do. You don't, you don't go after other people, right? Especially in a public space. So um, at the end of the day, you know, if you are targeted, you're you're gonna come out the other end winning because that person completely decimated their own reputation by going after somebody else. So that's what I would have to say about that is um, ignore them. You know, it's it's not, it's it's you know, there are so many more supportive people who are gonna be there for you and gonna work with you and want to know more, more about what you're doing. Yeah, and I think if, if, yeah, if you're speaking about somebody else's, I would just place it in the context of the large body of work and not spend a lot of time on that one. This study by the guy sitting in front of me, you know, is was wrong um, because that's dangerous territory and it's not, what if yours ends up being wrong later and theirs is right again, you know what I mean? So um, just to say, look, our, there's been this and this and this done before for these reasons and this is what they showed. But what we're finding is this, and this is really intriguing because of these new methods that we're using. And so that's the way science works is you're just building on one, one on the other. And so um, don't fixate on that one study that you're overturning if you, if you see it that way. You're just yeah. the dialogue. I think that's all great advice. And just um, like Janie said, framing it in a larger context and kind of trying to like imagine taking an outside perspective um, and just viewing the discipline you're in as a whole, this kind of work, this is what science is. This improves the science that everybody does. If you are disproving someone else's results, then the whole field is growing. That means that there's interest and there's activity and there's new findings. That should be exciting. It should be positive. We're all part of it. So I think it can just be a way of how you frame it some people who are really familiar with the work might understand some of the implications, but I think, like David said, it's best not to be very specific about any individuals or any specific publication or anything like that, um, but rather to focus on a broad context and just view, you know, everybody's moving forward when we get new results like this. Um, if you can frame it in a positive light like that, I think that's good. And then Janie, you had answered one of the questions. Would you mind reading it? Yeah, you bet. So uh, someone mentioned, you know, how can you effectively communicate your research in the early stages? Because uh, there are a lot of uncertainties and things. And I just think that 
if you just state what those uncertainties are and again frame it in this larger question like this is here's a really important line of research for these reasons but here's a question over here and we would like to solve that problem by looking into this um, we've got a bunch of stumbling blocks in front of us but we're really excited about what this could tell us um, so meetings are the place to do this these preliminary results when you finally send it off to a paper it needs to be in better shape but here's where you can put this out there and then have the conversation i also think that that sets you up to be in um a safer it, at least it can feel emotionally like i'm imagining myself safer position because you're presenting preliminary work there's still a lot of uncertainties maybe a lot of assumptions and so if a person is disagreeing with you challenging it hey you've already come out and said like this is a work in progress um i would like to collaborate with you and hear your ideas but then you can be in a sometimes a, a safer place to talk about it rather than feeling like you have to defend everything that you're presenting when it is still very preliminary. Um, so I agree with Jamie, be upfront. You've got to start somewhere. You're not going to have all the data to begin with. And so just acknowledging that is a good place to begin. And let's see, Christine, I think you launched our evaluation polls. Thank you. So there's two questions here. Thank you for, uh, for attending today. And um, there will be a survey afterward that you'll automatically be taken to. If you have additional comments, we'd love to hear them. Um, but we would just like to know how you're feeling about you know, being prepared to come to a science conference and your confidence about coming to a science conference. So there's two questions here. I'll give folks about 10 more seconds to finish answering. And I will say, since you guys all know, you know, me now, you guys are more than welcome to add me to your network. You guys can come and talk to me at the conference. Um, you might want to introduce that where you met me so that, because, you know, I don't know, I can't see your guys' faces or anything like that, right? Um, but yeah, just introduce yourself to me. I'm always happy to talk to everybody. It doesn't matter where you're at in your career. Um, I am always free to listen to, you know, whatever research or thing that you have going on. So yeah, add me to your network. I'll be happy. Same with me. I'm, my friends are all, we're all getting older, so I need some young friends. So come say hi. <laughs> That'd be great. <laughs> and myself and Christine, we are at the LPI. We, we are so involved in this conference and excited for everyone who's attending. So if you just want to talk to somebody who's got totally different things on their mind come talk to the science engagement people we'd love to talk with you um, and we've got some you know non-science things happening too in case you need a little brain break um, and so thank you all for filling out the poll um, to the person who said that they were feeling less confident i'm sorry if the training seemed like a lot but it's important to know that there's a lot of resources out there. And if you're feeling like, oh God, I thought I was prepared and now I realize I'm not, that's okay. You still have plenty of time. And if you want some additional help, feel free to reach out to me, to Christine. I'm sure I can connect you with Janie and David. Um, it's good to self-evaluate and realize, okay, maybe I've got a little bit of prep to do. It's a good place to be. It's not going to surprise you when you get to the conference. Um, but okay, at this point, I'm going to say thank you all so much for coming. We are all done. Um, I really appreciate your input and participation. And let's give a, a virtual round of applause to our awesome panelists who joined us today. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you all for listening. <laughs> all right.